application modernization, building intelligent apps, and um, kind of like driving developer velocity, which brings back to the topic here today. So in today's session, we are going to review some of the most common challenges that a lot of companies experience today and why a lot of these organizations are talking about the concept of platform engineering. So I see platform engineering as a nature extension to um, the DevOps story and a possible solution for us to address a lot of the challenges that we are going to see um, later on. That is to foster better collaborations within your organization, to bridge knowledge gaps, to remove the silos between your ops, your developers, and while doing all of this in a secure and compliant way. And most importantly, making your developers happy because we want to empower your developers to make them more productive, make them happier, so that they can really focus on what they're most passionate about. Um, that's application building and application innovation. So DevOps has been around for quite some time. The principles, the best practices, and tooling have already gotten us pretty far. You can probably imagine that a lot of things around DevOps has pretty much already been said, so it is a really, really mature practice. And organizations who are able to step onto this DevOps journey, they were able to going from agile, working to removing the silos, um, to really automate a lot of repetitive tasks, and to really accelerate and scale from there. But in the meanwhile, um, the scale of what we are doing has already increased dramatically. Technology has become more powerful and a lot more complicated. So for example, new knowledge domains have been added and new roles have been introduced over the years as well. And if we take a closer look into this from the lenses of developers, um, there has been growing complexity of the developer landscape. So with cloud native, with um, to shift left tooling, new frameworks, technologies, and the speed that we want to innovate, our software-driven business has really been influenced by this. And they all come out in a speed that even if you know all the frameworks, all new versions kind of like still come out in a very, very rapid pace. So with all this new tooling, technology, language, it adds a lot of distraction for your developers in your team. And they need to do a lot of things. They need to do a lot of learning, a lot of ramping up, a lot of context switching. So we stop speeding up. And the velocity is actually going down. And we see this happening in many organizations who are stuck in their DevOps journey. So in 2023, we have actually got the state of the DevOps project reporting that over 80% of companies who are currently stuck in the state that we are looking at here they are somewhere in their DevOps journey, but they just simply got stuck. And if we take a closer look into that developer experience um, further, so we're going to look at the first step in that process, which is going to be onboarding. So when it comes to onboarding a new developer into your organization, and oftentimes it is a very long journey that you have to go through. So not just around configuring a developer work environment, you probably also want to spend time understanding how to configure the application runtime environment properly so that it is following all the best practices, recommended patterns, and also compliance within your organization. And it turns out much of this process that you are looking at here is spent waiting. So waiting for resources to be granted, finding that out of date Wikipedia, and the journey here not only applies to new hires, it applies to developers who have um, kind of like cross collaborations across different projects, developers who move teams very frequently, or vendors who come on board and off board. And from an organization point of view, it is a very costly exercise to go through the entire journey here. And this complexity can often lead to some very unnatural behavior. When we take a closer look, onboarding complexity is not just a single obstacle to that developer velocity, we have got other challenges being surfaced here. For example, conflicting project configurations or lack of documentation can sometimes poison the entire developer workstation and leave a developer spending hours recovering from that. So what that means is that future support will be very challenging and will be very expensive. Lagging performance from longer halfway refresh cycles can also create constant friction to keep up with demands. And these challenges will only grow as your application infrastructure scale. 
your developers might be stuck waiting for um, the new test environments and raise tickets to raise um, to handle the environment changes. And a lot of the obstacles and challenges here, they will just cause gaps in your developer experience, burning them down and not having the speed and innovation that you should be having within your organization. And it may seem like that um, what we talked about only applies to the largest organizations. The reality is that businesses of all sizes are affected. And their unique concerns and opportunities mean that um, they need to proactively address some of these challenges before they got out of control. So for startups and grow ups, planning for growth is super essential and a top priority. Because uncontrolled growth can be problematic, scaling standards um, should be put into place to ease that growing pains. And adding automation can really help you multiply output. And handling that DevOps complexity at the scale that can lay groundwork for successful rapid scaling later on. For mid to large um, size dev organizations, cost is frequently a top priority. So inconsistent compliance can be a major driver of cost and can really ensure that your platform um, and pl application reliability. And for some of the kind of like very large dev organizations um, out there, um, with even stronger focus on compliance, um, process and developer autonomy is super, super important. So what is platform engineering? So we've defined platform engineering as the discipline of designing and building self-service capabilities to minimize cognitive load for your developers and to enable fast flow software delivery. So some people say it's probably DevOps done right or done in a scalable and resilient way. And there are some of the common goals here for platform engineering. So some organizations see this as self-service with guardrails. So that is keeping your developers really focused on delivering business value, secure and governed development with flexibility, rapid and secure onboarding and offboarding, which is probably some of the um, challenges that we looked at earlier, improve collaboration, remove their silos, and cost optimization for um, various tools, processes, and teams. So if you look closer into that list, there's also a lot of other things which are super important as well. But the question is that what is the biggest pain point within your organization and what makes your developers unhappy and unproductive? We have also got the culture shift um, to product mentality. So engineering platform manages a product, your developers being the primary consumers of those products, um, automate as much as you can and put in the right security and um, operations um, and kind of like architecture will be the key stakeholders that contributing to how you want to set up that platform properly. So if we break it down one step further, let's take a look at kind of like the key aspects of an engineering um, platform. So we have got the roles on top, the developers, platform engineers, and also kind of like infrastructure. So developers who probably want to ensure that there are automated pipelines, there are templates available for them to consume so that it makes it easier for them to get started building applications. And those pipelines, templates will usually be produced and prepared by the platform engineers. And the platform team will usually um, focus on governance and control. So that's that very important collaboration in between, in between the developers and also the platform engineers. So it's super important for us to find the right balance and a good level of control because we can easily go into one extreme of the spectrum or the other. One of the slides that I quite like is that kind of like this slide here, just to understand how we can balance the needs between developers and also platform engineers. Because tackling those obstacles that we looked at earlier for developer velocity can be quite challenging for your developers while striking the balance with your own organization's needs to maintain that secure and compliant environment. Because for all the developers out there, obviously they want to move fast. They want that agility, they want that flexibility, productivity, um, but there's also kind of like platform engineers um, in there, ensuring that, wait a minute, before you try out some of the latest technologies, we want to make sure that we have got the right governance, right security, standardization, and cost controls in place. So we really need to understand the full implications of this 
and we need to balance because every aspect of this, every aspect of this kind of like the balance that we're looking at here is so important to the overall success for your organization. So for example, think about the risk that may come from a VM left with an open port or a database that got an endpoint just exposed as a public endpoint. Or think about the compliance requirements an FSI organization needs to ensure, kind of like, for example, re-image um, the development environment every couple of weeks. So we need to ensure that how do we want to balance how much complexity that we want to give to your developers versus from a platform engineering perspective, how do we want to ensure that all the right controls are in place? So now I want to quickly move on to kind of like the key patterns when it comes to implementing platform engineering right. So we have got three notions here, the notion of starting right, staying right, and self-service with guardrails. So starting right here, which means that equipping your developers with self-service tooling, so really enabling them to kickstart their projects quickly, but while adhering to some of the best practices and um, governance defined through templates and policies. And when we say everything is code, this is not about I'm going to write JavaScript for everything within the organization. This is about treating the artifacts in your internal developer platform as code. So things such as, uh, things such as like platform as code, team configurations as code, or infrastructure as code. The second notion here is staying right. So this is where we want to ensure that we are maintaining the um, compliance as your projects grow and ensuring that your developers can continue to follow those best practices. And while at the same time, really managing your costs to avoid any um, kind of like cost overrun. So one of the services that I'm going to touch on later on is Microsoft DevOps and deployment environment. So those solutions can help you really ensure that when you create a new resource, when you create a new sandbox environment, those will be created in the right subscription, applying, to the, uh, applying the correct policies, ensuring that appropriate access has been granted and also tags has been attached as well based on the development team and also the type of environment. And very lastly, we have got self-service with guardrails. So self-service with guardrails means that that is our key foundational principle behind DevOps and Azure deployment environment. And that is to really empower your enterprise developers with that self-service model that are within that configure enterprise guardrails. And with both services, they can enable your platform engineers to really quickly and seamlessly configure those guardrails while kind of ensuring that they have got that self-service and scalable model. So we have got a pretty comprehensive kind of like stack, kind of like a tooling stack here. And our platform is designed in a way to offer that extensibility, modularity, and customizability that would really allow you to streamline your processes, automate DevOps, and create robust developer infrastructure with that secure, compliant, and governed environment for your application infrastructure. So with some of the core editors here and DevOps platforms, they're usually used by a majority of the developers out there, making it some of the most natural places um, to build developer enterprise infrastructure and to foster collaboration between your development and operations team. So we call our approach here platform engineering with self-service guardrails, and we really aim to provide your development teams um, with that autonomy and with automated friction-free workflows um, to ensure that governance, policies, and security, and management, cost management. So let's now take a closer look into kind of like the first notion here. How do we want to ensure that we are starting right properly, ensuring that we can establish that self-service model for our developers? So the very first service that I want to introduce you today is the idea of Microsoft DevOps. So Microsoft DevOps, it is a service that is designed to provide significant benefits, um, not only to the IT and devs um, out there, but also managing kind of like the uh, our developer infrastructure and also dev leads who are currently using it day to day. But how does each of the role actually interact with Microsoft DevOps? So we have got three personas here. So the first persona is IT dev infra teams. Second persona will be the dev leads. And also lastly, the end users who will be the developers. So for IT and dev infra teams, Microsoft DevOps ensure that we are still maintaining that centralized management and governance, 
So enabling them to provide the dev teams the building blocks to build our workstations based on your development and application um, requirements. And um, kind of like the IT teams will be still actively monitoring kind of like their use post deployment. And they can set up things such as network configurations. So network configurations would define which virtual network by default um, those workstations will get deployed to. They can set up um, security settings or even organizational policies using Microsoft Endpoint Manager in tune to ensure that their boxes are configured and used in a compliant way. Secondly, this is kind of like the new layer being added in versus kind of like a traditional VDI solution, which is the role of dev lead. So with some of the more technical foundational aspects taken, uh, taken care of by the IT teams, uh, we have got the dev leads who are now basically assigned the role as project admin um, that can configure dev boxes to suit their team's development needs. So they can select the right um, dev box skills. They can select different images aligned with their tool set customization. So that, for example, if your team is just embarking on the journey to start building um, AI applications, you probably want to build your custom image, which has got probably an ID installed and also all the Azure Open Air relevant packages installed in there. And then you can select a SKU, whether you wanted something to be more CPU intensive or not. Um, essentially, dev leads are now given the control and flexibility to curate a particular development environment and then make it available to the developers. And they can really set up that kind of like customized and tailored experiences to support the developer workflow. And finally, we have got the developers, which, are, which will be our end users here. And they are given the access to what we call the developer portal. So they actually don't need to interact with the Azure portal. So developers will just go into the developer portal and then to spin up their own workstations based on a particular dev box pool. And they just basically easily spin that up, go through the development tasks, tear them down on the device of choice, easily through the developer portal. So essentially what we are looking at here is that we are now already setting up the end-to-end -end flow while giving your developers that self-service experiences through the developer portal, while ensuring that in the background, we have got our platform engineering team centrally manage and configure that compliance, security, and control. Let's practice here. Probably a lot of you have already used this before, which is infrastructure as code. So your solution is composed of coded infrastructure. You're probably already using versioning for your code. So it probably makes sense for you to apply the same approach to your infrastructure as well. So infrastructure as code is essentially the management of your infrastructure in the descriptive model using the same versioning approach as um, your DevOps team use for source code. It gives you that consistency um, by applying that well-established process for deployment across different environments. So what that means is that probably you can just standardize the kind of like deployment into infrastructure as code, and then you have that repeatability and portability across different environments. So it makes it super easy when you want to replicate the same set of infrastructure across your dev, test, UAT, and production environment. It makes it super easy to, for your developers to replicate the same setup for them to test new code or try out new technologies. Um, it, it gives you that automated scanning of configurations to identify and, and address any potential issues or vulnerabilities, enhancing the overall security posture. And you can actually um, build in secret management into your infrastructure as code as well. So really allowing proper handling um, of sensitive information in your code base within the infrastructure. Um, you can do access control because um, you can enforce access control mechanisms through that infrastructure as, um, code, defining and managing permissions to ensure that only authorized individuals or even processes and pipelines will be able to make changes to the target infrastructure. So it really serves as that foundational element when it comes to that modern DevOps practices to help your applications um, set up in a way just like production environment. And, but in a much earlier stage during the life, development life cycle, and you can easily provision and tear down environment based in that um, infrastructure as code and can be validated, tested um, easily to prevent common deployment issues such as um, kind of like um, conflicting configurations and promote efficiency, um, repeatability, and collaboration across your team in managing that shared infrastructure. Um, next one here is one of the relatively newer features that we, I think, recently announced probably a year or a year and a half ago. 
um, which is the idea of Azure Developer CLI. So this is an open source tooling. So when you want to try out new technologies, um, for example, Azure OpenAI, there are usually lots and lots of documentation, details to consume, and many decisions to make around kind of like which would be the best option to host your application, what would be the right source code to use, and even if you're, you got your application to work locally, there are still lots of considerations to understand how, to, how do you want to get your application up and running in the cloud? What controls, what security that you want to put into place? So those are really, really big questions for you to consider. And as you research, more questions might come up, how to provision the right infrastructure, how to incorporate the right security, best practices. And as you dig deeper, the answer might just be depend on S, Y, Z. So how do we ensure that we can actually do things right, starting right from the get-go? And one of the options is Azure Developer CLI. So Azure Developer CLI is an open source tooling that can help you really accelerate the time to market, time to value, to get your application um, from local development environment to the cloud. So ACD will help you provide some of the best practices that can kind of like help you map to key stages in your development workflow. So whether you're working in your terminal, working in your editor, um, or working your CI CD pipeline, you can still apply the same mechanism. So how this works behind the scene is that if you look at the example here, so for example, there are heaps of templates available in the background catalog. Um, that's what we call the blueprint template. So one of the templates here might be a to-do application written by Python and MongoDB. So all you need to do is essentially run ACD init um, in your terminal and then specify a template. And behind the scene, it will start doing all the magic for you. It not only applies, kind of like start deploying the infrastructure for you, it will also start deploying the application code and also some of the kind of like um, relevant monitoring or security um, controls into the same environment. So that at the end of the deployment, um, once you run ACD up, essentially that starts kick off, kicking off the deployment process. But once that is done, that means now you will be able to have that initial working prototype within your organization. And this is all the code that you don't need to write, but you'll be having that kind of like uh, working prototype in your environment that you can uh, focus on to do further customizations. And a lot of the kind of like Azure OpenAI solution accelerators actually are available through the Azure Developer CLI. So it makes it super easy to get you started and then start building out um, some new technologies into that working prototype. So it is that complete template with best practices and tooling offered for you. So next one here is one of my, personally, one of my favorite tooling. So that is GitHub Copilot. So usually organizations will have million lines of code in their code base. And those have been developed over a very long period of time. In that code, there's a lot of technical debt. And being able to add in new features without breaking 50 other things can be a real challenge um, in existing code bases. And that is hard, right? As someone who's new coming into the project, um, really be able to understand how to get up to speed with the existing code base and then be able to start uh, working and delivering features. That's some sort of kind of a lot of challenges that our, like, a lot of organizations face today and will be exactly the use cases that can be tackled by GitHub Copilot. So GitHub Copilot, you can probably tell from its naming convention, essentially would be your AI um, code programmer tooling. So essentially, it, it gets contextualized into your code base and it will offer code suggestions really contextualized based on your existing code base aligned to your project requirement. So it can do things such as like converting comments into code. So once you start commenting out the code, you will see kind of a like suggested code being generated by Copilot and then start assembling that for you. It can start auto-filling repetitive code. So what's really, really powerful is that Copilot can actually learn from the way that you like to code. So that would be kind of like any, you can enforce any kind of like formatting, enforce any best practices, template, and then it will try to recommend similar code based on the particular structure. It can also show alternatives. So let's just say you're not happy with the first option in terms of suggested code. It will actually show you a list of potential um, options for you to um, review and you can apply your domain knowledge, you can apply your contextual knowledge to really apply the one that you think will be most accurate. So now taking a, taking a step back, right? Let's review this kind of like what we looked at so far. We looked at how we want to set up that inner loop developer experience. How do we want to really remove the silos, 
between different members of your team, between your ops team and also your developer teams. And how do we set up kind of like a consistent um, a self-service experience through tooling such as Visual Studio, which is going to be kind of like one of the most common IDE. We looked a little bit around Microsoft DevOps, how it can be used as a service to really provide your developers the um, agility and flexibility to quickly spin up a workstation. We also looked at Copilot, how it can also become a really, really powerful co-programming tool to really assist you become more efficient in what you're doing and remove some of the operational overhead in doing repetitive tasks. But now let's focus on to kind of like the second notion when it comes to accelerating time to value, when it comes to implementing platform engineering. So that is um, staying right. So if you want to ensure, kind of allow your developer teams to have their self-service, how do you do that and ensure that we are confident that they are not going to blow out 50 other things that are going to break existing infrastructure or existing guardrails in place. So the very first kind of like best practice that I want to touch on is the idea of Azure policy. So Azure policies provide you that control and governance at scale. So whenever you need to interact with Azure, you usually do this through ARM. And Azure policies deep integration with ARM is really easy for you to govern all of your resources and their properties from day zero and all your new, uh, new Azure services as they, get, as they get deployed. And this goes beyond Azure as well. So if you've got on-prem resources or multi-cloud resources, um, you can actually um, kind of like lean on Azure policy um, to really enforce that kind of like enforcement and remediation. So for example, with Azure Kubernetes services, I'm taking that as an example, you might be having policies that affect the resource definition itself. So things as, such as like version, the number of nodes, so if someone really tries to go in and deploy a cluster that doesn't align with your policy definition, those kind of deployment will usually just get rejected. So they can't push forward the deployment. And this is really good, right? Because you can really use policies to enforce remediation. You can also apply Azure policies to other common um, actual Azure services. So for examples, in the context of new resource creation, you probably want to enforce um, network injection you can also enforce tagging must be associated with the resources. So it really helps you report out that compliance state within your organization. When it comes to life cycle of policies, um, so policies are powerful, but they have the potential to change existing deployments and therefore managing policies using policy as code um, with gradual rollout um, are really, really important to help you kind of like uh, manage that policies and enhance security. So you can reuse any policies from the community, deploy through Azure policy um, to really enable the SCAL deployment and lifecycle management. You can use versioning just to help you support the immutability and zero downtime gap um, when rolling out a new version. Or you can even use integration. So integration such as like you can integrate um, data from your Azure resource graph to really allow aggregation um, of compliance data. And you can also join the data with other resources as well to get insight. So Azure policy is really, really powerful when it comes to enforcing that control across your Azure um, environment and estate. So now let's take a look at kind of like the CI, CD, pull and push. What will be some of the most common approaches when it comes to managing the changes into um, different target environments? So probably a lot of us are very familiar with get push because that will be usually the common um, CI, CD deployment method. So it will be usually kind of like facilitated or kind of like triggered by the developers, but ops can also manage this as well. So how it works is that for get push, which is the first approach here, is that you can probably see CI CD workflows are deploying the changes, deploying the updates, um, pushing the changes into the target environment, which can be an Azure app service, function app, or container apps, hosting your business um, logic or hosting the actual application. And the pipeline itself is usually triggered by um, code changes or merges and really driven by the pipeline tool. Versus on the other hand, we have got get pull. So get ops, which is the other um, name to it. And this is really taking it one step further. So the core idea of get ops is really having a get repository that always contains the declarative description of the infrastructure currently desired in the production environment. So you will have an automated process to make sure that your production environment will match the desired state that you have defined in your repository. 
So if you want to deploy a new application to an LS update existing one, all you need to do is to update the existing repository which contains um, that desired state and an automated process will kick off to handle everything else for you. So there's no deployment pipeline, but you still probably have a build pipeline. And there's no inbound, no external access needed, permissions to the cluster. So it pulls the state from that main branch constantly to ensure that we are um, kind of applying the desired state, kind of like the, the Kubernetes environment here, it is having the desired state that we have defined. So the choice between whether you want a gap push or gap pull mechanism really depends on your developer's needs. Assisting tooling and processes, um, some organizations do combine kind of like both approaches based on their specific scenarios and use cases. So we talked about GitHub kind of like co-pilot earlier, but one of the very exciting tooling that um, is also available as the GitHub platform is GitHub Advanced Security. And that is now one of our fastest growing products um, for a reason, because security, it is critical. It is the top priority, um, no matter the sector. And in the past a year or so, um, GitHub actually announced over 70 features to really improve your application security, um, testing, software, supply chain, visibility, and hygiene. So we have got three main features under GitHub Advanced Security that gets really easily integrated into your pipelines, into your code base. So we have got code scanning, so which is um, powered by static analysis engine code QL, and a broad community of security researchers. Um, and we have now got code scanning, which is kind of like actively scanning your code for any vulnerabilities, any issues. And we have got secret scanning, which makes sense in the sense that basically scan for secrets so that if it identifies any secrets that it is going to um, kind of like prevent the code being pushed into that repository. So with this now kind of like a lot of features here, you get kind of like a lot of kind of AI generated kind of like features, capabilities um, with alerts for JavaScript, PyScript um, in your pull request. And what works kind of like hand in hand with um, GitHub Advanced Security is Microsoft Defender for Cloud. So Microsoft Defender for Cloud, it is a um, native, provides you that really native kind of like um, application protection as part of the Azure platform. It is made up of security measures and best practices that are really designed to protect your applications from cyber threats um, and vulnerabilities. So Defender for Cloud combines a couple of different capabilities. So it helps you incorporate that good security practices during software development um, process or DevSecOps, and you can protect your code management and environments and your code pipelines. You get insights into your development environments um, in terms of the security posture from a single location. So it will also help you kind of like have that centralized policy um, management where you can define security conditions that you want to maintain across different environments. And the policy itself can get easily translated into recommendations that your team can action on um, to ensure that your security posture can continuously improve. Last, um, last best practice here under the second notion of staying right is Microsoft Cost Management. So Microsoft Cost Management provides you that really comprehensive set of control um, and tooling to help your organizations effectively manage their cost in the Azure Cloud environment. So one of the common ones might be uh, management groups. So management groups allow you to organize and manage your resources hierarchically based, your, uh, based on your organizational structure and uh, um, hierarchy. So suppose your team has got multiple departments and each department has got their own set of Azure resources, then you can probably apply management group to uh, represent each of the departments, um, really creating that structured hierarchy for resource management. So things as such as like you can apply um, business owner tag just to document who's owning what. Um, you can apply absence tag just to document the application context or even call center tag just to help you establish any um, cost chargeback model. Um, budgets are also very important to ensure that your costs are controlled properly and actively and alerts can be sent out when your spends are reaching certain thresholds. Uh, we have also got cost allocation, so I help you establish any um, cost chargeback. And Azure Advisor, which helps you kind of like put together a lot of recommendations, do active scanning to understand whether there are any underutilized 
um, resources that you can potentially shut them. So it essentially gives you that recommendations, actionable insights around how you can optimize your environment from a costing perspective and really align, best align with some of your development and workload patterns. So lastly, we are going to look at um, the very last notion here, which is um, self-service with guardrails. How do you want to set up your um, self-service environment and also that developer self-service foundation? So the first one that I want to touch on here is the idea of Azure deployment environment. So this one here is actually one of the building features into Microsoft DevOps. It is natively available on the same portal, on the developer portal. So how it works is that it really empowers your developers um, the ability to quickly and easily spin up application infrastructure with project-based templates that can help you establish that consistency and best practices while maximizing a security. So when we say a deployment environment, essentially it is just a template that is being pre-configured with a set of a collection of Azure resources deployed in pre-configured um, subscriptions. And Azure governance will be applied to those subscriptions based on the type of environment, such as sandbox, staging, um, and production. So from there, dev teams, um, they will be assigned kind of like the templates that they need to work on the projects. And developers can easily deploy those environments through the, um, on the developer portal on demand or have those automatically deploy using CICD pipelines. So regardless of how the environment is deployed, uh, its resources will get automatically routed to the relevant Azure subscriptions, whether it is test, production, and production. And the really, really good thing about Azure deployment environment is that developers actually don't need to be granted the access to create those resources. So for example, they don't need to be create, um, assigned with a contributor role or even kind of like subscription owner role to be able to create those resources. All they need to be granted is that within the context of Microsoft DevOps, the ability to create those deployment environments. Um, once they're given those access, they can easily go ahead, go onto the portal, and then create those um, environments on demand. Um, and they can change the templates behind the scenes as well. Those have been centrally um, managed and pre-configured by the platform engineering team. So, Recreating kind of like an application that can replicate a existing um, environment can often be pretty challenging. And we talked about kind of like Azure Developer CLI earlier to help your developers um, easily going from local to the cloud environments. Um, there's also the very new integration between uh, Microsoft kind of like um, the Azure Deployment Environment and Azure Developer CLI. So Azure, CLI, Azure Developer CLI, we mentioned earlier, it is that open source tooling to really provide your developers that really friendly, um, easy to get started, to help you start building, deploying, and managing your applications on Azure. And with this integration with AZD and um, Azure Deployment Environment, developers can now actually really streamline commands such as like AZD up, AZD provision, AZD um, deploy to spin up their um, application infrastructure from project specific and curated um, infrastructure as code templates and deploy their code on newly um, created environment. And the integration between deployment environment and ACD really makes it easier um, for you to deploy your code into a newly provisioned environment or an existing environment, really enabling you, you to test your code and changes in real time, identify and fix issues in a very safe environment and ultimately shipping faster um, and also really shipping higher quality applications um, and really kind of like having this really natively built into your existing and your developer experiences. So we mentioned earlier that some assembly required, but it is also too much assembly required. So we are working very closely to really create that self-service foundation that will really accelerate your team's ability to get started in platform engineering using the best in-class offerings. So the goal here is again, is that self-service with the guardrails. I think those would be probably the four keywords I want you to take away um, with you today. Um, so really empower your developers to be able to um, move faster and give your operators the, the governance, um, the control, the confidence that the devs want to deviate. So um, we looked at a couple of things today. So an open kind of like, obviously, kind of how do you want to establish the right environment uh, with that boxes? Um, how do we want to ensure that extensible security uh, policies 
um, are default, kind of like um, across different environment, whether you are using a single cloud, multi-cloud, or even a hybrid cloud strategy. We have got um, the assisting integration um, that we looked at earlier from some of the AI tooling and also the developer workstations so that they can really have all the tooling that they need to focus on the application building and application innovation. So through a lot of kind of the things that we touch on today, we are really hoping to achieve the vision that we are creating a developer-centric um, self-service experience that will actually way some of the onboarding complexity, developer velocity, challenges um, that we looked at earlier and provide a platform with orchestration, with software, um, agility, engineering systems that are really designed in a scalable and um, resilient way. And lastly, I wanted to kind of like share that we actually launched a new kind of like Microsoft Learn Path that's really focused around platform engineering um, to help your team kind of like navigate the world beyond DevOps um, and join the journey of platform engineering. And we are sharing kind of like the lessons learned from our own journey, kind of like adopting platform engineering and also what would be the best practices um, towards working closely with our customers with actionable steps um, that your team can take on along this journey. But again, kind of platform engineering, it is a really transformative kind of experience. Often the journey to find the right tooling, right processes, right technologies to use within your team is not a linear path. But along this process, there'll be a lot of lessons learned, a lot of analysis, a lot of new insights that you will be able to gain, and you'll be able to craft something new. And ultimately, really help you remove the silos from your operations, um, and also between operations and your developers, and hopefully help you really accelerate that developer velocity. But I think that's pretty much it in terms of the talk from me today. Um, I'll probably open up the floor to see if anyone has got any questions. First of all, a round of applause for Regina for our talk. It's a nice end-to-end -end story to it. Um, questions for Regina, and I'll bring the mic to you so everyone can hear it. Don't be shy. I've been, I've been amazed how, I mean, I, I love as your DevOps, but it's so much manual work. I've been building pipelines and all that sort of stuff. How comprehensive are your templates? So um, are you referring to any specific tab? Yeah, that's a good question. So usually a lot of things that we looked at today, we usually um, open source some of the Kickstarters just to help you kind of like set up that groundwork or the foundation in the Azure environment. So that would be kind of like all the key infrastructure or the kind of like um, kind of like fundamental elements that you need to get the environment up and running. Um, later on, for example, Azure deployment environments, we have also got kind of like some templates available that are designed for different development purposes. So for example, there might be templates that are probably a lot uh, available to help you spin up and Kubernetes cluster with all the monitoring tools in place so that those are the code or the infrastructure that you don't need to worry about. You can easily just click deploy and then it will spin up the development environment for you so that you can go in, focus on the application building, but without worrying about kind of like how you should be setting up the Kubernetes cluster, what will be the right networking ingress controller to use. That's all been taken care of by some of the templates that we, we open source. Yeah, so I don't think it's ever going to be a comprehensive fits every single person's demands of, of things. So ch take